presentation today by Professor Rassan Maxwell. Um, Rassan uh, grew up in New York City where he was exposed to um, diversity, which later on played into some of his interests academically. Um, he's been interested in symbology, especially in symbology um, of symbolism in uh, careers, such as if you're a lawyer um, in one country and you also happen to be of a certain ethnicity, what does that mean um, in terms of how much power or respect that you get? Today, uh, Rasan will be talking about diversity in terms of supermarket products, uh, as observable in supermarkets in the UK and in France. So I hope you enjoy his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, I enjoyed this very much. It seems like there's a mixture here of, of TAM students and maybe some undergrads. Uh, so that's great. Um, so this is a paper, uh, research I've been doing. The title is Gastrocosmopolitanism, uh, Supermarket Products in France and the United Kingdom. It's a collaboration with a colleague of mine at NC State. Uh, she's a cultural sociologist and I'm a political scientist and together we are looking at these things. Um, for what it's worth, um, this is a, a work in progress and something that we will be submitting to uh, a journal in the near future. So we're very much happy to have all of your uh, comments and feedback and suggestions uh, for improvement. And so the broad, oh, this one, right, I'm not doing the last slide. Um, the broad topic uh, is this question of cosmopolitanism. And it's a phrase or a philosophy that you might have heard of um, the idea behind cosmopolitanism is that you are attached to universal human values. Um, you are thinking broadly about what unites us all as humans. Um, at the same time, you're also respecting cultural difference. So you view us all as humans. Um, but you're aware of divisions, and when you're aware of those divisions, you have respect for those divisions. So all of us here are all human, um, but yet we all have different cultures, and yet I would not impose my culture on you, and so on and so forth. And that is the idea of being cosmopolitan, being aware of our, of our unity, and at the same time respecting our diversity. This is juxtaposed with things that are um, provincial or parochial or nationalist, and in this sense, nationalist is a, a negative, a, 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 an insult. So provincial, as you all know, is something that is focused on uh, a narrow frame of mind based on the narrow place from which you come, whether that place is New York City, North Carolina, or a region of France, um, the notion that you only see the world through that prism. Um, parochial, similarly, and in the context of Europe, nationalist is the sense that you only view things and how it relates to your nation. And so you only care about whether it's Americans, whether it's France, whether it's Sweden, whether it's Germany, whatever it is, you're only concerned about your nation. That is a much narrower frame of mind than looking at things as a cosmopolitan uh, uh, person. And so, as you can perhaps imagine, and you may have different ideas here, you may have, uh, 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 you may have different ideas, but in some of the philosophical debate, cosmopolitanism has emerged as this ideal goal that we should all be striving to, to get away from these narrower perspectives and narrower frames of mind. Uh, and in particular, in Europe, uh, this debate has come up as Europe, as you hopefully know, has gone through many different uh, forms of conflict uh, internally and externally over the past uh, decades. So the big question, uh, normatively and empirically, is to what extent is Europe cosmopolitan these days? Uh, and you see these pictures like that um, symbolizing the, the, the promise of a new cosmopolitan Europe. Um, and so in thinking about uh, whether or not Europe has become cosmopolitan, and here, so just to flesh it out for some of you um, who may or may not be um, already in the European studies uh, uh, trajectory, you know, World War II, World War I, World War, the World Wars I and II were dramatic examples of how parochial nationalist thinking led to conflicts within Europe that then killed um, millions of people um, obviously beyond that, the horrors of the Holocaust, parochially thinking that your version of whatever Arianism was better than the Jewish people clearly led to a lot of problems. 
Um, and then more recently, this debate has come up around uh, whether we can unify Europe uh, as, as one Europe and not get into those nationalist uh, tendencies, but also can we integrate our immigrants? And that's my particular area of, of expertise in the past, which is what I built on for this paper. So there's some optimistic evidence. So on the one hand, as I said, that photo indicates that Europe uh, is a very demographically diverse place. Um, those of you who've been to Europe, especially if you go to the cities, um, it looks very diverse, um, both in terms of global uh, skin colors and global cultures, um, but also across Europe, uh, especially the, 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 the metropolises of, of London and Paris uh, have all kinds of Europeans uh, walking around. So it's very diverse demographically uh, these days in Europe. Um, but also, popular culture and consumer products uh, are increasingly diverse. Um, so I guess most of you uh, are, are of the internet age, um, but previously you would have television set ch sets uh, with two or three channels, and they were all based in your local culture. Today, you can go on the internet and get popular culture from anywhere in the world. Um, people in Europe are increasing, and elsewhere in the United States as well, are increasingly likely to listen to music from all over the world. Uh, when they buy their consumer products, if you took a look at the, um, well, maybe, I'm not sure, but if you took a look at the, the, the cultural influences on your clothing, they might increasingly come from all around the world. Um, not if you're wearing the, the UNC sports stuff. But, um, but increasingly, the popular culture and the uh, consumer products that people are buying are not just based on their narrow region or their narrow country, but people in France are aware of what's going on elsewhere in the world uh, and are incorporating that into their uh, daily life. And in addition, um, there's increased mobility. As I said, Europeans, uh, uh, you know, prior to this recent events, could move freely without uh, showing passports at their borders, and so there's mobility, you can move around Europe, you can work and live all around Europe, so increasingly they're moving around Europe, becoming connected, uh, forming relationships, uh, both uh, personal, uh, romantic relationships, and they have families that are spread across Europe, and so people are uh, connecting in ways beyond their little village, or their little city, or even their country. And of course you can feel free to ask questions at any point in time or comments. Um, and so this has led many people to say, well, now there's a new European identity. Uh, and so people these days are much more likely to feel European, perhaps, than they would have 30, 40, 50 years ago. And certain people, certain demographics, certain kinds of people may even be, feel more attached to Europe than to their, the nation state in which they were born. Um, that often is uh, you guys are the target demographic, highly educated young people who move around. Uh, you're perhaps the most likely to benefit from this, but there's a growing sense of European identity uh, that is evidence that we've moved beyond this narrow world of regions and, and nations. However, um, the battle is not won. Um, there is still evidence, there's pessimistic evidence, as we say, that cosmopolitanism uh, has not triumphed. So the first uh, piece of evidence is that, as I said, one big counterargument is that cosmopolitanism is mainly restricted to the elite. So when you talk about Europeans who are going to go for uh, uh, to go to a university in, in another European country, or who are going to go study on a language program, or who are going to go study, or who are going to go travel during the summer. It's people who have the means to do all of these things, and those are primarily elite people. Um, if you work as a janitor, or if you work uh, cleaning, uh, cleaning the grounds, um, you're most likely not going to be sent to London uh, for work. Uh, if you work in a company, and if you're in a high enough position, you might have a meeting in London, and a meeting in Paris, and a meeting in Berlin and, and Milan. Uh, and so it's certain kinds of people who are experiencing this mobility and this cosmopolitanism and other kinds of people are not. So that makes people think that cosmopolitanism is really only developed among a thin elite and that the majority of Europeans are still parochial, provincial, and, and nationalist. Moreover, um, even the elite often will only be giving super, first superficial lip service to the notion of cosmopolitanism. 
So if you study these things through public opinion surveys, if we were to ask you, you know, to what extent do you value the cultures of other societies, um, hopefully most of you would say yes. Um, and so a lot of people are very willing and easy, it's easy for them to say that they value diverse cultures, um, but in practice they may not always live their lives that way, um, both in their own consumption habits um, and uh, uh, somewhat, I don't know if it's more important, but the, in practice they might also be very skeptical of people from other cultures. And in particular, hopefully you're all aware that this immigrant integration issue is a big, a big deal in Europe and a lot of people, um, not necessarily the majority in all countries, but a fair chunk of society is not happy about the immigrants, they're not happy about the way they're integrating, and so there's a definite trend, a uh, definite uh, uh, section of European society that is skeptical of foreign cultural influences, and in particular, the ones that they may be seeing uh, on a daily basis. Okay, so, so that means that we have both optimistic and pessimistic evidence of cosmopolitanism, and for those of you who are interested, there is a long uh, debate in many academic fields, like I said, from philosophy to sociology, anthropology, some of political science, geography, all these different fields are debating, you know, how is cosmopolitanism developing? Is it a good thing? How should it develop in Europe? And so we had one small intervention with this paper. Um, and the particular interven intervention looks at the cultural influences on supermarket products. And, um, we chose supermarket products because supermarket, pro supermarket products are evidence of broad cultural trends. Um, they are, and I'll speak a little bit about, a little bit about this more later, they're, they're evidence of, of, of mass culture. So in all countries and societies, you can find some niche, niche, very hip, very uh, whatever demographic that is aware of all kinds of things, but it may or may not be representative of much of the culture, but supermarkets, are by definition this mass entity trying to get as many people as possible through their doors, and so that's more of an indicator of broad cultural trends. Which allows us to gauge to what extent uh, cosmopolitanism is a broad phenomenon or just limited to a narrow elite. Um, so just to uh, make that clear, if we were to, if we were to have focused on college students, as I said, or executives in certain companies, or professors, or whatever, some segment that's very mobile and very willing to move around, we might reach very different conclusions about the extent of cosmopolitanism than if we looked at a, a broader indicator, such as supermarket products. So in doing that, we ask three questions. Um, first, we ask, to what extent are foreign cultural influences present? Uh, so if there are no foreign cultural influences present in European supermarkets, then clearly they're locked into a national, uh, provincial way of, 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 of eating. However, if they do have foreign cultural products, then that's evidence that they have expanded and they've accepted uh, new cultures into their uh, daily diet. Um, then, after we see whether they have foreign cultural influences, we ask, which foreign influences are present? Because having a lot of uh, Norwegian items uh, in a Swedish supermarket would not be as indicative of cosmopolitanism as it would be if they had an extensive range of Sudanese products. So you have to distinguish among these products and see which influences are present. And then finally we have to ask, how are they presented? So they might have some special segment for this strange and bizarre exotic Mexican food with some silly sombrero hat saying, look, it's Mexican day in the supermarket. That's a very different way of approaching culture than having them be smoothly integrated into the products and everyone knows what these products are. The silly sombrero hat would not be evidence of cosmopolitanism, but having the products there where no one needs any explanation is better evidence of cosmopolitanism. So these are our three uh, practical research questions. Okay, um, as I said, supermarkets are not the only way. And we're not saying that supermarkets are the best or, or, or necessarily the only way, but they are a useful way of understanding cosmopolitanism, in part because food is central to identity. So you can look music, as I said earlier, music and dress, and you do need to dress every day. Um, but you definitely need to eat every day. And beyond that, uh, the 
food is something that connects you uh, on a very emotional and spiritual level um, because it's something that you are literally consuming and so it's bringing up all your senses are involved uh, and it's connected to your histories and your traditions um, uh, especially in Europe or especially outside of the United States you know there's 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 a history of how these foods were made and and it can be very political in the sense of are we removing our national histories are we altering them for something else it's potentially very political and so tapping into something that is so emotional uh, and so important to people's lives uh, gives us a sense of how deep is this cosmopolitanism really going um, and existing research uh, often focuses on restaurants um, for various reasons. There's a fair amount of work on restaurants. Uh, and restaurants are important for many reasons. Um, but for this particular question, they're somewhat less useful. As I said, um, in any country around the world, you can find specialist restaurants that may cater to, as I said, a specialist subset of people who have particular types of tastes but that won't necessarily tell you anything about the broader society, um, whereas supermarkets are a much better indicator for our purposes of the broader society and how mainstream mass Europe uh, is, is, is integrating cultural products. Uh, and supermarkets increasingly have become part of our mass consumer culture. Uh, so you've all been in supermarkets, they're increasingly like the Targets and the Walmarts in the sense that they've done extensive research on their consumers and how you purchase and when you purchase and what you're likely to purchase. They have very sophisticated logistics that are moving their products around to get them in and out in exactly the right prices. And so supermarkets are part of this 20 and 21st century mass retailing culture that is extremely connected to the consumers and is trying to uh, connect them with the, uh, the products that they're going to buy. Um, so restaurants are also connected to consumers, but again, they serve a much narrower niche uh, of just the however many people can, can fit in their restaurant as opposed to supermarkets that are marshalling resources for the masses. So in an ideal world, we would look at every single country in Europe, um, but we didn't. We looked at France and the United Kingdom. Uh, and there were a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is that both of these countries are large, uh, they're globalized, and they're diverse. So they have the basic foundations, the basic uh, uh, building blocks to be cosmopolitan. And so you could also potentially, in a different study or a follow-up study, look at how those you know, big, global, diverse countries compare to smaller, uh, more isolated countries um, but that's not what we did here. Uh, we started with two big, globalized, diverse countries. But in addition, they do give us some range. So the UK is a most likely case. Uh, the UK, out of all the, uh, is one of the most likely countries in Europe to have cosmopolitan food culture. Uh, and there are two reasons for that. One is that their own food is not very good. Um, and they've <laughs> always been open to foreign foods, not always, but they have, as the spectrum goes, they've been more open to foreign food uh, than other European countries. In addition, um, their particular approach towards integrating immigrants has been fairly open to cultural diversity. So when they receive immigrants, they are fairly open to immigrants' diverse food in this case, but also their music and perhaps their religion and their various ways of living uh, can, can be encouraged in public life. And France is, the, uh, is the, 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 the opposite of that in a couple of ways. So the UK is a country where they're not so precious about their food. Doesn't mean that they're not proud. Doesn't mean that some people aren't skeptical of foreign foods. But as these things go, they're relatively happy to have uh, foreign foods, uh, and they're relatively open to uh, immigrant cultures. So if there were any country in Europe that should have a cosmopolitan food culture, it should be the United Kingdom. France, on the other hand, is the opposite. France is the least likely case. Um, perhaps you'd already thought about that in your head. So as you know, um, or perhaps have heard the stereotypes, uh, France is a place that is extremely attached to its 
food traditions. Um, Italy's another, but France, in their way, it's a more national tradition, and so they're proud of French food and what it symbolizes, and in their interpretation of French food, they're relatively resistant to innovation. Now again, obviously, as I said, if you spend time in Paris uh, or any of the big cities, you're going to find interesting and modern and creative restaurants, um, and I encourage you to do so. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the broad mass culture is reflective of that mentality. So the broad mass culture in France is among the least open to uh, diverse uh, food. And in addition, their way of dealing with cultural diversity is to require assimilation. So when France has a lot of immigrants, it is not very receptive to the idea that immigrants should be speaking their own languages, practicing their own religions, eating their own foods, and behaving their own ways. The notion in France is there are a lot of formal and informal pressures to encourage immigrants to adopt the French way of life. So for these two reasons, France's um, skepticism of, of cultural diversity and France's uh, skepticism of foreign foods, we would expect there to be less uh, uh, cultural cosmopolitanism in, in French supermarkets. And therefore, if we were to observe cosmopolitanism in both the UK and France, it might be a promising indication of how broadly uh, developed cosmopolitan is, cosmopolitanism is uh, across Europe. As I said, we didn't have the time to do um, every European country. Um, so the data, where do we get our data? Um, we look for the top supermarket chains uh, in each country. I forget the exact number. So in France, it's Carrefour, Leclerc, uh, Intermarché, Système U, and uh, Auchan. And that's in order of, of the largest. I forget the, all the numbers. But essentially, these five account for um, 85, at least 85% of sales among supermarket chains. Um, they're the only uh, supermarket chains that have more than 10% of the um, the market. Uh, in the UK, we look at Tesco, Asda, Sainsbury's, and Morrison's. Um, so again, as I said, these are um, uh, mass supermarket chains that are huge. Um, there are others that are focused on more target niche demographics that might be different. They might be more cosmopolitan or less, but these are the mass ones. And so within each of these chains, we focus on prepared meal products. Uh, and what that means is uh, the, the prepared meal. So when you go into a supermarket, um, not the endless boxes of, of whatever, but the meals that they are preparing uh, for you to buy and to take away. Um, and we did this for a couple of reasons. One, uh, practically, it would just be very... Um, it would be extremely laborious to, to look at every single product. Um, but we're not afraid of labor. Um, it's also not clear what individual products mean. So you can have products that can be used in many different ways. For example, uh, you can have cornmeal. Uh, and you can stock cornmeal in your supermarket. Uh, and here, in this region, you could use it for grits. Um, someone with a different inclination might use it for polenta. Someone with a different inclination altogether might use it for fufu, a West African dish. So individual products are less revealing of cultural uh, uh, trends in the society um, than prepared meal products, because prepared meal products are the supermarket's way of saying, this is how we think you eat in this country. And we've prepared a dish, a plate, a meal, and this is how we think you do it. We might put up uh, cornmeal because we know that many people are going to use it in many different ways, and we don't care as long as you buy it. So it's less reflective of the mass culture than this prepared meal product, which is their way of saying, this is what we think most people are, are, are eating. So that's the logic. It's, sort of, it's, a, it's a snapshot of, of, um, of how they think the masses are eating. Uh, and so we got the data um, from supermarket websites. Um, we could have gone to the supermarkets and looked at all of them, but they all have online, they all have websites, and you can order your prepared meals online. Uh, and so they have uh, extensive 
uh, sections of, of the different prepared meal options, the same way you would find here um, at, at various places. Um, obviously, I'm happy to talk more about that if you wish. Um, so these, this is an overview of the number of products uh, and the date. So you can see it was mostly, we mostly did it, or I mostly did it uh, at the end of last year. Um, and then the number of products refer completely, I was I imposed nothing. This is just the number of different products that they put, if they put an item with a price tag on it, that was a product. So not all the products are equivalent. So one product might be um, uh, uh, a, a a platter, a meal platter with a central meat and then some side dishes on it. Another product might be a baguette. Um, so there's a whole range of products, but for just the purposes of charting it out, we're looking at uh, the number of products. And the number across the supermarkets ranges from Carrefour has the least, you see 142, uh, Tesco has the most, and, or, or um, Leclerc has the, the most. Um, so that's where we got it. We just go on, get the get the products, and then classify them. Um, yeah. So then, once we've gotten all these products, the question is, how do we make sense of it? How do we know what this reveals about European culture or about French and British culture? Um, so each product is coded for its cultural origins. Um, which may or may not seem simple to you, but it's very complicated. It can be very complicated. We focused on the central item. Uh, so whatever the central item in a dish was uh, received the, the national or regional coding. What did I say here? Yeah. So, um, so for example, uh, pasta was always Italian. It was always Italian, um, regardless of whatever silly toppings they may have put on top of it that Italians would find reprehensible. We always coded it base. Pasta was always Italian. Quiche was always French. Sushi was always Japanese. Um, when you had uh, meat or fish dishes, um, we tried to identify the central tendency and not the spices on top or the side ingredients. Um, and so that doesn't mean that we're saying that all dishes that appear under the heading of pasta are equivalent in their cultural uh, meaning. But we start by looking at that, and then afterwards we look at, OK, so they're all having pasta, but what are the different ways in which they look at pasta? And that, that we do afterwards. But to simplify it, we started out by just looking at the base item and classifying it, it that way, to just get a rough sense of, of where they're drawing inspiration from. Um, now, as I said, everything or lots of things have multiple cultural influences, and we had a huge. We, I mean, so we had a huge argument about uh, macaroni and cheese because I was uh, very insistent that it be coded as as Italian. And to my colleague, she's actually uh, somewhat of a specialist in the cultural sociology of food. Um, she has a book coming out on foie gras in the U.S. and France, and uh, so she's involved in all these food. Um, food uh, uh, associations and networks and whatever, and people studying food. And so she's like, look, we're not going to put something out with her name attached to it that says that macaroni and cheese is Italian. So like, everyone is going to laugh at me. And, and, and we had to put extensive footnotes to protect the reputation, showing that clearly it's an American dish these days. But for our purposes, it's more interesting to say, look, the origins, they got the pasta from Italy. Then when they came here, they did all kinds of things to it, and it's been reintroduced to the world through the American lens. Um, but for the purposes of this product, it's simpler to say that it started in Italy. We'll talk more about this. And actually, I'll come back later to the, the, the um, Italian-American uh, influence has become a global thing as well. Um, as I said, lots of dishes have multiple cultural influences, and we can come back to this later. Uh, if you want, we stuck with the, the central one. Um, so the first uh, basic cut at the data are looking at the prevalence of foreign cultural influences. As I said, we wanted to know to what extent are foreign cultures present or absent in uh, European supermarkets. Um, and so these are the data. There are three different um, 
columns here, the far left or the, the first column of numbers are the percentage of the products that are primarily domestic influences. Um, and we can see that that number is much higher in France than it is in the United Kingdom. Uh, so in France, Leclerc has over 90% of its products uh, are, are French. Um, whereas uh, in the United Kingdom, you have a much lower percentage. Barely a third of their products are UK in cultural origin, British in cultural origin. So this fits with the stereotype that France is, is much more likely to be proud of its own cultures, uh, cultural food, and the, and the UK is much more open to foreign cultures. Um, then we split it between European and non-European, um, because as I said earlier, and I'll come back to again, the non-European is potentially more controversial, or it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different question. And we see that, that in both countries, depending on the supermarket, for the most part, the, there's actually a larger percentage of non-European influences than European influences. This is especially prominent in the UK, where um, it's almost half in most of the supermarkets. And in fact, as I'll say again and again, the single largest uh, foreign influence in each of the four UK supermarkets was Indian food. Um, so on the one hand, this confirms our uh, expectations about France being um, more national than the UK. But it's also showing some cosmopolitan openness in the sense that both of them have a fair amount of non-European, and both of them have more non-European than European. So there might be some cosmopolitanism going on. Um, but again, looking more closely, which foreign cultural influences? So they're not at random, they're for specific reasons. So. And I said, non-European is generally bigger than European. That's maybe surprising, um, maybe potentially uh, an encouraging sign of cosmopolitanism. Um, I said, India, the largest influence, foreign influence, in all four UK chains. Um, it's roughly, it's like anywhere between 16 and 18% of all products. So the, the British products were roughly a third. They were roughly 33%. Um, and... Uh, India was about half that, 15 to 18 percent. Um, so sizable percentage of product. Um, however, one uh, uh, reason to be skeptical of the extent of cosmopolitanism is that in each supermarket, pretty much all of the foreign cultural influences come down to these few countries, Italy, the U.S., East Asia, and the main post-colonial uh, society. So in France, that's North Africa. In the UK, that's India. So pretty much everything comes from these five places, or four places. Um, there's almost nothing from Eastern Europe, even though it's a lot closer than any of those other places. There's almost nothing from Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, almost nothing from these places. Despite the fact, that, again, that especially Sub-Saharan Africa and Eastern Europe, has a lot of immigrants in these countries, but their cultures are not being uh, represented in supermarkets uh, at the moment. So this is making a step. So, so it's cosmopolitan, but it's in a very narrow and particular way. Um, and in particular, this is, raises this point that cosmopolitanism combines with globalization to give us a standardization. So... On the one hand, we're able to access things from around the world, and we're able to use the internet uh, to access things from around the world, but it's often the same thing that gets a million hits or a million likes or a million views. Um, the one thing that everyone can now access around the world, sure, we can all access it, but it's also just the one thing. Uh, and globalization in the uh, supermarket realm means that companies are able to get things from around the world, but they're also chasing the same consumers, doing research on the same consumers, figuring out what the same consumers like. And so there is also a convergence in, we've all done the same research and we've all figured out that everyone likes to have their bread toasted this way and then put this on top. And that's why you see the same damn sandwich in every single friggin' airport. Um, <laughs> but um, cosmopolitanism with some barriers, with some barriers. Um, cosmopolitanism plus globalization. And frankly, I don't know how many of you, I mean, I guess, will be 
younger, but airport food has improved dramatically <laughs> since I was your age. Um, okay, so the positive influence is the fact that cosmopolitanism is coming from immigrant cultures. I'm going to say the immigrant cultures in Western Europe are um, uh, contested, they're controversial for many people. There's a big ongoing question about how well these groups are integrated. Um, are they also, are they ruining society, even if they are integrated, all these things. But at least here we see that it's part of the food culture. And so in France, <coughs> North Africa averages 3% of the products <coughs> and 11% of the foreign products. It's always among the top four of all <coughs> foreign cultures. And so North Africa is one, the point here is North Africa is one of the main foreign cultures for French supermarkets, uh, despite the fact, as you may know, that North Africa is one of the more controversial cultural sources of immigration uh, issues around Islam uh, and, and transnational connections. So it's a controversial culture in politics, but it's accepted in the supermarket. So neither one is necessarily you know, better or worse, but it's interesting, despite the fact that they've been able to develop this cosmopolitanism uh, in the supermarket. As I said, in the UK, India has an average of 17% of the products. Uh, it's a, a quarter of the foreign product. It's always the top foreign product. Uh, and so, I mean, we can go into it. India is not as controversial as, say, Bangladesh and Pakistan, um, but it still functions as, as this, this uh, a post-colonial country where the people look very different and we're not necessarily happy about them. And it can be controversial politically, but in the supermarket, we're happy to have it. Um, so these are the most challenging and stigmatized immigrants, but yet they've been uh, uh, accepted into the cosmopolitan supermarket. Um, however, despite that somewhat promising indication, there are very few products from all the other immigrant groups. So there are a lot of other immigrant groups that are essentially absent from, uh, from, from these supermarkets. Um, Caribbeans are big big immigrants in both countries, um, in France, and in France there are even actually French people who are migrating within the country, much like Hawaiians migrating um, to the, the, the lower 48, and they only have one Caribbean product, it, it's these cod fritters, and they have them, they have one thing of cod fritters in every French supermarket, sometimes they even label it as Asian for some unknown reasons, they don't even know what the hell they have, um, that's the only thing they have. In the UK, they have a bit broader range of Caribbean products, but not that much. So and that's just one example. There are lots of immigrant groups in all these countries, but they're really only focusing on North Africa and, and, and India. So that's a, a reason to be skeptical of the development of cosmopolitanism. So this Italian-American combination um, is particularly interesting, and as I said, difficult to get your head around. Um, together, they account for half of all foreign products in France and over a third of all foreign products in the UK. It's a really a powerful thing. Um, in part, this is because uh, the US is a superpower uh, and it's able to export its culture. Uh, a lot is through the movies uh, and the music and the television, but also the food, the McDonald's and so on and so forth. So the US cultural influence is big. Um, in particular, not just any culture, because we do have a lot of influential uh, high-end restaurant developments, and some of that is actually also being exported. But our fast food and snack culture is especially successful. Um, these large companies that can send these various kinds of, of fast foods and snacks. And so that's what you see in the, in the supermarkets. Um, a lot of hamburgers a lot of hot dogs uh, in, in, in both countries, the supermarket. Um, in France, they are particularly interested in chicken wings, uh, bagel sandwiches, you know, ca catching on to that abomination that spread out of, out of New York in, in the States. And then wraps, you know, again, we could talk about this, you may or may not want to, but, but wraps are very interesting because clearly these things are not American. I mean, they're, they're, it's the many cultures around the world wrap their food in a flatbread. I mean, that, that's the whole point. But then, America put the word wrap on it, uh, wrap, and so then now you see 
France, uh, France has wraps, which didn't even have to go through America to be called wraps, but they use the English word wrap because of the uh, uh, American cultural influence. So that's uh, very interesting. Um, in the UK, they're particularly excited about chicken nuggets. And for the moment, um, this Southwest uh, Tex-Mex stuff, so lots of, uh, and Southern stuff, so lots of pulled pork, barbecue, chili, um, and so part of that is just, um, I suspect that that's the current, that, oh, I know, that, that is the current trend, and so these things cycle around, but the, in terms of which snacky uh, foods they're going to have, but the main concept is they're going to be having some snacky American food. Now, Italy, on the other hand, has become a global phenomenon, um, as we know. Um, you, again, I don't know, but I can't see initially all of you, but for the most part, uh, 20 years ago, uh, Ital or 30 years ago, Italian food was very, uh, not very, it was somewhat stigmatized. It was like a low-class food. It wasn't seen as particularly desirable. Um, but over the past 20, 30 years, it's gained a lot in reputation and availability as something that represents this very healthy uh, Mediterranean diet with the olive oil. Um, it's also very delicious. That doesn't hurt. And so it's really spread around the world in the past 20, 30 years, and we see this here. Um, in addition, this Italian-American cuisine has fused together. So the combination of Italian food getting more respect and Italian-American cuisine combining with this American um, economic engine means you're going to get all these things like the pizza uh, and the macaroni and cheese spreading uh, uh, around the world. A particularly interesting uh, variant on that is when the, the French supermarkets had these products they call les box, um, which are these boxes. I don't even know why they had to do that, but clearly they think that the word box somehow adds this, uh, you know, exotic element. So it's a box of food with like some pasta thing in it with some, you know, American style sloppy, messy topping, like, you know, meat chunks, like a macaroni and cheese with chunks of meat and whatever, but like that's the thing for them, if it's a les box with, um, you know, some American element to it, then it's, it, it, it's, it's, an, it's interesting, or at least the supermarket thought that it was. Um, so um, it's a global phenomenon, and it's being fused with this interest in the American snacky culture. Um, now, East Asian food is we're not sure if this is really an evidence of cosmopolitanism. Um, it could be, because it's an evidence of many countries being very far away from Europe. Um, you know, it's very far away. It shows the broad cultural reach. Um, there are a lot of East Asian immigrant communities in these countries, but they're not necessarily the most present in mainstream culture. I mean, if you had to do a short stereotype, it would be that the East Asian immigrant communities have been more segregated and more closed within themselves and less uh, present in mainstream society, you know, for a gross oversimplification. Uh, so it's more likely that their presence in these supermarkets reflects uh, the global influence, uh, initially emanating out of China and Japan, uh, uh, Japan at first, maybe then China, and then now spreading. And so now, there's this growth in European cultural omnivorousness, as I said, looking into wearing clothes from all over the place, having you know beauty products, uh, all kinds of, of you know things that are that are getting them in touch with other other cultural influences. Traveling. So 20, 30 years ago, it was much less likely that the Europeans were going to be uh, jumping off to to Thailand, uh, but starting in the 90s and so on and so forth, you can go increasingly to East Asia. Uh, explore that place, and then when you come back, you want to be able to eat that food. And so you have this real growth, if anyone's interested, in the, in the tourism industry, and that is spurring an interest in, in the food and the culture. So potentially an evidence of cosmopolitanism, um, but we'll come back to that. But the question is, how are these foreign cultures portrayed? So there are these, a lot of these foreign cultures, remember I uh, said, um, there might be a limited range, which makes us skeptical, but how are they portrayed? You know, as I said, if it's portrayed as this jokey caricature with a sombrero, that's not really a very uh, uh, useful way of understanding Mexican cuisine. On the other hand, uh, if it's presented without explanation, it shows that people know what this stuff is. So, 
Um, the post-colonial immigrant influences, um, you know, they might be particularly vulnerable to stigmatization, um, but, but we don't find that they are. Um, so in France, every supermarket has couscous, a tagine, and, and tabouli. Tabouli also is very interesting because it's not from North Africa. They reinterpret it through the North African lens, but that's a, another question. Um, some of them appear in an exotic category. Um, so that makes us question, is this being exoticized? However, in France, the exotic category of food is for all non-French food. So as soon as you've left France, once you go to Greece, whoa, whoa, whoa look at that. So that, they have, they have, what do they have? They have moussaka, they have all kinds, they have paella, you know, that strange, bizarre thing with rice. Um, so they have all kinds of non-French food classifies as exotic. Um, uh, uh, so even though they're including some of these immigrant cultures in there, they're also including everything that's not French. Um, the closest they get to exoticizing is using the adjectives of oriental and traditional, but again, we're claiming that's not really, it's almost a, uh, uh, a description. It's not necessarily really exotic. They, um, they don't have anything, um, did I put it up? Um, they don't have anything that, that says, you know, this, this, this strange and, and wild food. Nothing, it's just, here's the food, it's oriental, it's traditional, here it is. Um, they don't uh, use foreign cultural influences. They don't use the North African influences in their own food. So there might be some sort of a barrier there in the sense that they're not prepared in these supermarkets to bring the North African cultural influences into their own dishes. You know, in re certain high-end restaurants you'll find that, but not in the supermarkets. However, to show the extent to which these influences have become part of the French uh, uh, mentality, they use harissa in chili con carne. And so harissa, as you may know, is a spice mixture from uh, particularly Algeria, from northern Africa. And so when they're preparing chili con carne, which is you know, this chili, this meat chili uh, from the Americas, they are using their version of a spicy thing. They're using harissa from North Africa. So it's become part of their mentality their culture, just not for their own food, but for other types of food when we need it, that's what we're going to use. So you can interpret that as an element of cosmopolitanism if you wish. It shows you how it operates. Now in the UK, there is an extensive selection of Indian dishes. As I said, there are all kinds of Indian dishes, much more extensive than just uh, these, the three that you had in France, um, including the fusion dishes, there are, at this point, the fact that there are fusion dishes, I mean, there's no equivalent in France. Chicken tikka masala, as you know, is a British Indian fusion thing. It's been called the Britain's number one food, whether it's been taken over um, it, by other things remains to be seen, but, but they have a lot of British Indian fusion dishes, and they're also very present. Um, they have their own Indian menu category, which could potentially be seen as exoticizing, but in reality, the way, just the way Britain organizes the menus, and we can talk about that if you, if you wish. They have uh, geographic headings for all of them. Um, and the only adjectives that they use, which I don't consider to be evidence of exoticization, are rich, creamy, aromatic, and hot. Uh, so they're describing the food, um, but they're not exoticizing it. They're describing it for what it is. It is rich, and they make it in a creamy way, and it's aromatic. So these immigrant cultures, potentially vulnerable to being stigmatized and exoticized, are not. So that's a promising evidence of, uh, of uh, cosmopolitanism. And these Indian spices are used in British dishes. I don't know how commonly, but they are used. Um, now, East Asia, on the other hand, is definitely exoticized. Um, and this is where we see the, the, the clear. They have menu categories such as voyage to Asia, or literally exotic Asian. So here we know, it's exotic. Um, the language, this is ideal for your exotic aperitif. Um, they call the food the discovery platter. And I'm, I'm blanking on it, but it's not, it's not really that much of a discovery. I think it was like a freaking shellfish platter or something. But, but anyway, um, the, uh, that's, what they're, that's the language they're using for East Asia. Um, UK language similarly, discover exotic spices. This one I love, 
perfect for adventurous cooks who love to try different recipes and flavors from the Far East. However, that description of adventurous cooks is for tofu, plain tofu. <laughs> um, so, you know, that shows you the level that they're, or the, the lens through which they're operating. Um, now, so there is some exoticizing of Eastern Asia. Um, now, Italian and the U.S., for reasons that perhaps are evident, have become fusion. Uh, they've fused more easily with uh, UK and, and French stuff. So in, in Italy, and you know this from, from all your own shopping here, stuff like various Italian cheeses, balsamic vinegar, pesto, pancetta, the tomato basil combination, so delicious and appealing, and enjoy it for the last few weeks while you can, um, is a common addition to to so many things in, 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 in both of these countries. And it's clear that people are adapting these Italian uh, things and, and, and using them in ways that, that, that they want. Uh, so there's a fusion there. Um, the American ingredients, you know, admittedly, America is further away than Italy is from France uh, and, and, um, and the UK. So it's not quite the same fusion. But they're happy about the butternut squash. There's also some squash in the UK. Cranberries, this is a recent thing, are making a, a, a show of it. Uh, brownies and cupcakes in their own interpretation. Cupcakes following on that trend from about 10, 15 years ago that, that still is now in the supermarkets. Um, and then the interesting thing, again, I don't know, some of you may have heard about this if you're, I don't know if you follow as closely as I do, but the, the cakes, the, the cake um, in France have become a thing in the past five to 10 years. And what a cake is, in the French context, is the American muffin recipe um, made in a savory fashion. So in it, you can put vegetables or ham or, or whatever, you have, whatever you want to call it. So it's, um, and you can also have it before the meal, like in the Paris or you just have it for lunch. Um, and so it's this new-ish new thing, a savory baked loaf of bread, essentially. Um, but they call it, but the fact that they're calling it a cake, um, shows that there's this American influence in the fact that it's based on the muffin recipe. So um, that has become a, a, one of the more prominent examples in mass eating of, of uh, French-American fusion cuisine. Um, barbecue sauce and marinara Monterey Jack cheese, as I said, in, in and Monterey Jack cheese, as I said, in the UK, they had all those Southwestern products, so they're using those things. Um, not much fusion with Asian or African influences. Um, you know, they're further away, perhaps less amenable, also less present, but that shows us that when, even though there, there's some fusion, they're not really looking, it's not distributed equally, it's only for certain cultures. I didn't address it in this paper, we didn't address it in this paper, but you could imagine that there's subnational variation. Um, the food culture, you know, in um, North Carolina, different from the food culture in Washington State, from so on and so forth. Same thing if you've been to these countries in Europe, the food culture in uh, the big cities, it might be different from the other cities. Um, the border, in a place like France, that borders many different countries. You know, it borders Germany, it borders Italy, um, it borders Belgium, and all these places borders the Atlantic. Uh, so all these places have different food culture. There's some evidence of that, we looked into it, but um, but this is a national picture, and, and this is the, the picture for this. Um, so, to conclude, um, there is evidence of cosmopolitanism in uh, French and UK supermarkets. Um, there are significant numbers of, of, of foreign culturally influenced products. Uh, there's limited exoticization, so they're very comfortable. They know what harissa is, and they, they're comfortable using it in new and creative ways. Um, they're immigrant cultures. They don't feel the need to, you know, make it look funny or, or, or pitch it any way. It's just straightforward. We all know what the, what the products are. Um, Yet, there's also evidence of that narrow parochialism that I mentioned. They're looking at it through, which is, you know, it is what it is. They're looking at it through a certain lens. Um, they're not equally open to all cultures in that ideal form of cosmopolitanism. Um, so there's a very limited range of foreign cultural influences. As I said, it's the same five regions accounting for pretty much everything. Um, 
So that suggests that for the future, we're going to continue, it's not that dramatic, but we're going to continue seeing uneven cosmopolitanism. So we are increasingly open to the world as we can find cultures uh, through the internet, through travel, through experiences, through mobility, through mixing with people. We can find all kinds of things, but we're not going to find everything at the same time. We're going to find certain things based on certain trajectories. And if we're talking about supermarkets, it's based on a certain economic logic of what is pitching best in the focus groups and what are we going to sell. And once we've all agreed that that pitch is best, then we're all going to have the same product. So that is our, uh, uh, our, our paper for the moment. And I'm happy to hear your questions and comments.